Greetings and welcome to our webinar. My name is Professor Anne Karagosian, and it is my privilege as the director of the Promise Armenian Institute at UCLA to welcome you to our first Zoom-based event, jointly sponsored with the UCLA freshman cluster course, Political Violence in the Modern World, Causes, Cases, and Consequences. The title of today's lecture and discussion is Survivor Object, the Modern Life of a Medieval Manuscript from Genocide to Justice, to be presented by Professor Hevenar Zeitlian Watanpah of the University of California, Davis, and with discussion by and with the editor and art critic, Harag Vartanian. This event promises to be a fascinating, in-depth exploration of a shocking example of the intentional destruction of religious art during and after the Armenian genocide, that of the Zaytun Gospels. This is but one example of a central element in the mass violence that took place during the horrific genocide that took place in the Ottoman Empire over 100 years ago and claimed approximately 1.5 million Armenian lives. I am so very gratified that Dr. Serap Rukan Chengel of UCLA's Promise Institute for Human Rights, one of the instructors for the political violence course, has coordinated this impressive program for us today. We especially welcome the freshman undergraduate students in the political violence cluster course and look forward to your questions and participation along with the rest of our audience. I would also like to acknowledge the co-sponsorship of this event by the UCLA Center for Near Eastern Studies and the UCLA Working Group in Memory Studies. Thanks to all of our partners for their contributions to this important event. Dr. Changel will provide formal introductions for our speakers in a moment. But let me note that for those of you watching live via the Zoom webinar platform, you have an opportunity to send questions to us by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom portion of your screen and typing in your question. For students in the political violence class, please identify in the Q&A window that you are a student in the class and we will try to call on you first or early. Please be sure in your questions to be as specific and succinct as possible, and we will direct as many of the questions as are practical to our speakers at the end of the session. Also, please note that this event is being recorded for future viewing at our Promise Armenian Institute website and YouTube channel. And in the unlikely event that this Zoom webinar drops for any reason, please just connect right back to the same link as it will put you back into our Zoom session. And now it gives me great pleasure to turn the event over to the coordinator, uh, Dr. Serap Rukan Chengil, Dr. Chengel is a distinguished research fellow at the Promise Institute for Human Rights in the UCLA Law School and in the UCLA Center for Near Eastern Studies. She is an anthropologist whose work focuses on gender and sexual formations of sovereignty, nationalism, kinship, violence, memory, and displacement in the Kurdish borderlands of Turkey, Iraq, and Syria. She is also one of the faculty instructors, as I mentioned, of this year's cluster course on political violence. And her focus in the instructional component of the course is on the Armenian genocide. Dr. Chengel earned her doctorate in anthropology from the University of Texas at Austin and was a Manugian Simone Foundation postdoctoral fellow in the Armenian studies program at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. So Rukan, I'll now turn the webinar over to you. Thank you very much, Anne, uh, for the introduction. Um, I would like to, and thank you all for joining, actually. I'd like to start with a brief, with some brief information about the course that we are teaching and um, 
uh, why we are co-sponsoring this event. Uh, the political violence in the modern course is a team taught undergraduate class that studies different historical geographical contexts of mass political violence with a connective and comparative method. It's an annual course and this year we have been focusing on the Armenian genocide, the Holocaust and French colonial violence in Algeria. Our guiding thematic interests are on the formations and processes of violence and issues related to memory and post-memory, truth and justice and aesthetic representations in the aftermath of genocidal interruptions. And it is within this background that we have been quite amazed and inspired by Professor Wadham Powell's recent book, The Missing Pages, The Life of a Medieval Manuscript from Genocide to Justice. And I'd like to thank Professor Wadham Powell once again uh, for accepting our invitation for this webinar. Uh, professor Wadham Powell is a professor of art history at the University of California, Davis, and at the same time a fellow of the Guggenheim Foundation and a National Endowment for the Humanities Public Scholar. Her research expertise is on the visual cultures of the Middle East. She is the author of the book titled The Image of an Ottoman City, Imperial Architecture and Urban Experience in, in Aleppo in the 16th and 17th centuries, which received a book award for urban history from the Society of Architectural Historians. Her second book, The Missing Pages, has also, also been multiply awarded. It is the only book to, look, to, to win awards from both the Society for Armenian Studies and the Ottoman Turkish Studies Association. Uh, the book also won the gold medal in history from the Independent Publisher Book Awards and was shortlisted for the William Sarayan International Prize for Writing. Professor Wadham Powell's impressive scholarship truly has been recognized also um, by numerous research grants and fellowships awarded by institutions such as the National Endowment for the Humanities, Fulbright Hayes, Social Re uh, Science Research Council, and the John Paul Getty Trust. We are also totally excited that Raghavar Tanyan, the much famed editor-in-chief and co-founder of the Hyperallergic Podcast, is also join joining us today for a discussion with Professor Modern Powell. Besides his connection to the hyperallergic, Vartanian is an editor, art critic, curator, and lecturer on contemporary art with expertise in the intersection of art and politics. His curatorial interests are focused on theories and practices of decolonization, which he states has been informed by his own experience of being a part of the post-genocide Armenian diaspora. Since 2017, Vartanian has also been running an exhibition project that explores the contemporary legacy of Ottoman studio photography. And this work, which features works by a number of Armenian artists from different generations, will be published in book format in 2022. Uh, our webinar flow will be as follows. First, uh, we'll hear Professor Wadham Powell uh, presenting her talk, The Survivor Object, for about 20, 25 minutes. She'll then be joined by Ragwartanian for a discussion, uh, which will last about 40 minutes. Um, and then we'll continue and end with a Q&A session uh, with the audience. Again, thank you very much uh, for your participation and Hagnar, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ruken. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you so much, Ruken, uh, for inviting me and for teaching this amazing class. And uh, thank you, Professor Ann Karagosian and the whole team at the Promise Institute for organizing this. And Harag, thank you so much for joining me. I'm so proud to uh, have this discussion here with you today. And I want to take a moment to acknowledge how much your writing and uh, your role as editor and mentor to other writers has been important in raising these issues of social justice, politics in the art world from many different perspectives. So, um, so thank you. And I'm proud to stand next to you on the Zoom screen. So I'm going to share my screen now. Okay. So, um, I um, how did I um, 
get the idea of working on this book. Um, I read a news item that in 2010, on June 1st, that the Armenian Church in Los Angeles had sued the world's wealthiest art institution, the Getty Museum, the Getty Foundation, the, I mean, the Getty Trust. Um, and oh, the lawsuit alleged that the um, um, eight uh, pages that uh, Getty had in its possession that were taken from the Zaytun Gospels had been stolen during the Armenian Genocide. And so this lawsuit and beginning to read the documents associated with it, um, it took me down this rabbit hole of trying to understand what had happened to these pages and how that story intersected with other issues, including the history of the Armenian people, the history of the genocide, um, and the politics of the art world today, and especially museum politics today. Um, I was very taken and intrigued by the story of the Zaytun Gospels, in part because um, the Zaytun Gospels is one of those rare survivors of the large scale destruction of Armenian cultural heritage that took place during the Armenian genocide. And this is something that as, as Armenians, we know very well. And so I sort of summarize this idea by showing you these before and after photos. Um, and this is the monastery of St. John the Precursor or, or Surkarabet in Mush, which was the most important Armenian shrine in the Ottoman Empire. So second only to Echmiadzin, which was, of course, not in the Ottoman Empire. And so here's a photograph uh, of it at the Library of Congress um, on the eve of World War I. And this is how it stood in uh, 2016. And so this is a, a snapshot, a summary of uh, the fate of most of Armenian cultural heritage um, uh, during the years of the genocide. And um, this photograph, which is kept at the Nubarian Library in Paris, also summarizes another difficult moment of this process when survivors of the genocide um, returned to um, the, their uh, hometowns from which they had been exiled and found their holy places uh, looted, destroyed, in disarray, um, and uh, they were faced with the task of figuring out how to rebuild their lives and their communities, but also how to rebuild their religious and cultural institutions and how to uh, take the measure of that loss and to um, move to mitigate that loss. And um, I became very interested in, in these experiences and the responses that individuals like the, the man that you see on the screen um, experience in those years. So what is sort of the theoretical background to um, all this? The, the, it's the, the debate about the role of culture in genocide uh, and mass violence. Um, I, I'm showing you an image of Raphael Lemkin, of course, the Polish um, a Jewish jurist who coined the term genocide. Um, and I probably don't have to tell this audience of students the, or the, about the importance of his thinking uh, in shaping our understanding of uh, mass violence and genocide. Um, I just want to note that from the beginning of his thinking about what he uh, want this new crime uh, that he wanted to describe with the term genocide, he was uh, uh, very preoccupied with what he called vandalism, that is the destruction of cultural heritage of the targeted group. And he saw it as um, it, it, something that is front and center to the destruction of cultural heritage. As it turned out, however, when the Genocide Convention was accepted by the UN in 1948, for a variety of reasons that I'm happy to discuss later, um, very deliberately cult cultural destruction was taken out of the def definition of genocide. So um, since then, um, the 
writers and activists that use the term cultural genocide, but it is um, more of a theoretical term and not um, a legal term. But that doesn't mean that the destruction of cultural heritage has not been the subject of international legal instruments or other legal concerns. It has come in through other ways. And so that is also the, the, the legal travels of these concepts and their implementation in the courtroom was another thing that I was really interested in learning more about and, of course, understanding the relationship of those uh, types of realms with art history and the work of the art historian, which is my job. And so as a, an art historian, I have to start with the object. So what was the object in question here? It was... Um, and this is a diagram that shows what we're talking about. We're talking about eight sheets of parchment, which uh, folded together form 16 pages of which eight are beautifully illuminated. Um, and these eight paid illuminated pages are were meant to be seen together in pairs, match in matching sets. So this is the first matching set, the second, the third, um, and the, the fourth, this is the last one. Um, so, um, okay, we'll stay here for now. Um, what do these uh, images represent? They are canon tables, um, and canon tables are a standard um, item, a standard feature of gospels manuscripts. They are an index, they are concordance tables that show uh, where in two or more of the four gospels which make up the New Testament, uh, the same event in the life of Christ is recorded. Um, uh, this is important theologically because it shows that even though the four Gospels have certain differences, they are connected and to together they tell the, um, the, the story of the life of Christ and its, of course, implications um, for the Christian, Christian faith. In many medieval manuscripts, especially in the Byzantine and Armenian traditions, the canon tables were the most uh, lavishly illuminated and uh, presented elements of a medieval manuscript. Uh, they, these were the sections that received the most precious materials, an abundance of gold leaf, um, and the kind of artistic care and virtuosity that we see here. And uh, this is in spite of the fact that they, these are not narrative paintings. Uh, for the modern viewer, they are a little bit enigmatic. What we are seeing is an architectural frame supported by columns. Inside the columns, there are grids of numbers. Um, and the, so we have passages of abstract um, if, uh, images and ornament. And we have uh, passages of uh, lively naturalistic renditions of fruits and birds. So visually, these are very, very rich, but also kind of enigmatic. And that was part of their goal in medieval times because they would be considered me um, a medium for reflection and, and thinking. So a highly, highly intellectualized approach to, to art. So um, the, these um, the eight illuminated pages are um, uh, at the Getty today. And the way you would see them today in uh, exhibition would be like this. And this is an admittedly bad photo that I took on an exhibition. But what I want to show you is uh, this crease in the middle of um, the pages. And um, the more I worked at the Getty and uh, looked at these uh, manuscript pages and try to understand them, the more it seemed to me that this crease was like a scar that told a story about the life of the manuscript that demanded to be attended to. And I always imagined that this was caused uh, when the um, pages were removed from um, the book when they were folded and taken away. And so it was part of this crease marked the moment where the eight pages, the illuminated 
uh, parchment pages at the Getty became a fragment. Um, so, um, and no amount of careful conservation of which, you know, the Getty specialists are absolute masters, no amount of careful conservation would smooth out the scar. So um, the next um, thing I wanted to do in, in my quest to understand the Zaytun Gospels was to visit the book from which they were the canon tables were taken, which uh, some might say miraculously has also survived and is located today at the Madina Taran in the Republic of Armenia, the Mashtots Institute of Ancient Manuscripts. And here is the book with uh, its wonderful binding uh, that incorporates uh, carved elements from its original binding uh, from when it was created in 1256 in the middle of the 13th century by Toros Roslin, the most celebrated um, Armenian medieval illuminator. Um, I um, then wanted to travel to the place where this object was created in present day Turkey in the castle of Hromgla, medieval Hromgla, present day Runkale, uh, very close to Urfa on the Euphrates, on the westernmost bend of the Euphrates, um, a, which was um, a uh, militarily and historically significant location. Um, and so I made my way to this place because I wanted to understand and see what I could learn about the manuscript and its artist from the places where the manuscript had spent time. And this is what uh, Haromgla or Rumkale is today. Um, there are some remnants of its medieval glory where it was in the 13th century. It was the cent a major center of production of manuscripts under the patronage of Rosaline's patron, the Catholicos Constantine, um, was a major figure in the church and also major patron of the arts. This is one of the few remains that is still apparent above the ground. Uh, it was probably the, ba the base of a larger architectural ensemble uh, that has not survived. Um, and this uh, tower incorporates these two carved areas, these stele or khachkars. And if you look very closely often through the, the assistance of a zoom lens, you see that something has happened to this Khachkar that has got to be very, very deliberate. Um, while many elements of this um, carving have been left intact, so we see here um, an animal carving, an eagle with their wings uh, outstretched. Uh, what was once here, which uh, was an Armenian cross and remnants of the Armenian alphabet that these letters that once spelled the abbreviation for the name of Christ, these elements very specifically and very deliberately have been erased. And of course, uh, one can see these um, examples of targeted erasure of Armenian or Christian traces in many parts of present day Turkey, but it was very important for me to see this in Hromgla um, and to understand how, you know, it takes, this was not, you know, the work of a hothead on a drunken night. It was, it, it takes planning and effort to do this kind of uh, targeted erasure. And it was important for me because it led me to think really deeply about what restitution means. The lawsuit was about um, a type of restitution and what that means and what kinds of returns are possible or not possible in, um, in disputes over restitution. And it was clear that at this uh, beautiful castle, uh, it was as if Roslin, the Catholicos Constantine and the Armenian community had never existed. There was no mention that they had ever been here or created these beautiful manuscripts here. And so it was clear that uh, certain kinds of return um, had been foreclosed because of the genocide and its continued denial and um, the, the position of the uh, uh, Armenian community and Armenian culture in present day Turkey. So uh, restitution cases are always very complex and I'm happy to discuss them, but this one was a particularly complex one because of the genocide and its effects.
So next, I retrace the steps of the, of the life of the manuscript as much as we could reconstruct. And um, at some point, probably in the 17th century, the um, Zeitung Gospels, which was made for the personal use of Catholicos Constantine, by this time, it made its way to Zeitung the legendary mountain town in the Taurus Mountains with its own very unique tradition and, um, 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 and culture. And of course, um, Harak's family is, uh, is from Zaytun, so I'm, I'm very happy to acknowledge that. And it is um, a legendary place in the Armenian imagination, and it is uh, an incredibly beautiful place in the landscape as well. So um, my sources for um, trying to understand historical Zaytun, I'm trying to advance my slides, um, and I'm sure it will happen. Um, were, so what were my sources for understanding the history of Zaytun before the genocide and uh, to understand the, the role in which the Zaytun Gospels had played in the life of, in the, in the Zaytun community uh, before the genocide were, uh, of course, Ottoman sources. I'm showing you the official almanac of, uh, of uh, the imperial almanac of the Ottoman Empire, where um, a very important uh, statistical and other information about Zaytun is given. There uh, is a lot of information about Zaytun from Armenian sources. There is the manuscript itself, uh, which contains colophones or Hishadagaran's notations, um, uh, this, including the one by Toros Roslin himself, the artist. Uh, but later, uh, individuals also have made notations in the manuscript. So um, the the Zaytun Gospels itself is a repository of the history of the various communities for whom it was a sacred object. So in some ways it tells its own story. It speaks um, in very interesting and complex ways and in very different kinds of voices. Um, and uh, I also had um, memory maps that had been created by survivors and others who had spent time in Zaytun. So this was my method to uh, find these fragments of information about this pre-genocide town and to try to find these traces on the landscape. Um, I was also lucky to be, um, to be able to build on the work of many other people, including Vahe Tashjian, um, my friend and colleague, who is also the editor of Hushamadian, um, the, the website that um, investigates Ottoman Armenian communities. And he found in the Jesuit archives in Beirut a set of very rare photographs that illustrates um, Zaytun in probably around 1911, so just before the end. Um, and um, there uh, I was uh, able to find photographs of the area where the Zaytun Gospels was kept. It was kept in the Citadel of Zaytun here in the Church of the Holy Mother of God in a special relic box in a special niche. Uh, but I was never able to find a photograph of the church itself. Um, here are some street scenes. And um, so here is what um, uh, the location of uh, the citadel looks like today. So you recognize that the landscape is the same with these very dramatic uh, mountain formations, but of course no trace remains of old Zaytun or very few traces remain. Um, and when I was there, I mean, this is why I think field work is so important and can be so transformative, um, is that when I was there, I, it dawned on me that of all the very rich religious and cultural life of Zaytun and of the monasteries in these mountains um, that were believed to have been created by apostles. They were ancient monasteries that were centers of learning, but also of the creation of manuscripts. And there were legendary uh, manuscripts and relics with great power in these mountains. Of all of those treasures, the only one that had survived to our day, even in 
if in two parts, was the Zaytun Gospels. And that's when I started to think about the concept of a survivor object. What does it mean to have this kind of object that has come down to our day after going through so many traumatic experiences? Um, the miraculous or unexpected survival of uh, an object, what that means, what that pretends, and what are the kinds of demands that objects such as this um, ask of us. These are not simply beautiful works of art, though they are that most certainly, but they are also something else. Um, and this was my attempt to digitally reconstruct or bring back the Zaytun Gospels to um, Zaytun, to present day Suleymanla. And maybe with Harak, we can maybe explore ideas about uh, digital technology and the, what role it can play in um, restitution projects, which is, of course, very, very fraught. Um, I'm going to skip ahead to... Um, um, uh, the, the, the April 1915, April 8, 1915, was when the uh, deportations began in Zaytun. Zaytun was one of the first localities targeted um, for the uh, in, internal exile of its people by the Ottoman government. Um, at this time, uh, a descendant of this man, um, um, a man from the Surenian family. I don't have a photograph of him, but I'm showing you the only photograph I could find of a member of this family. Um, the descendant of this man who was a local notable um, of the house of Surenians in Zaytun, they were known as the Lords of the Citadel. Uh, they were the notable leaders of the Citadel neighborhood of Zaytun. Um, on when they were uh, forced to to leave Zaytun, uh, the um, Surenian prince of the of the of the day, uh, Asadur Surenians, took the Zaytun Gospels from the church with him, and that's how uh, the Zaytun Gospels left Zaytun. Um, and we can only speculate as to why he did that. Um, but they, but they were they were being forced to leave everything behind. They were facing an unknown journey uh, that was clearly going to be dangerous, even if they didn't know at the time how dangerous uh, and fatal it would be. Um, so he takes this object with him in part because it is not just a holy book, but it is a, book, a holy book with power. It does things in the world. It has the power to protect and to punish enemies. And so to have such a book in your possession was a form of protection uh, much needed uh, at, at, a, at a dangerous time. And so in the possession of, uh, of the uh, Surinian prince, the gospels uh, arrived in their uh, next stop on uh, during the genocide, which was the city of Marash, where the Surinian family and their retainers were allowed to spend um, a year before they were deported again to Derzor. But between the time when they were in Marash and when they had to leave, they made the acquaintance of this man, Dr. Harutyun Der Hazarian, known as Dr. Artin. He was um, uh, uh, an officer in the Ottoman military. He was a surgeon. And because he was a military surgeon, he was uh, exempted from deportation because his um, talents were important to the war effort. He worked at this hospital, the, um, uh, the, uh, the hospital of Marash, uh, which was very close to the area where the Surinians uh, were spending 1915, um, uh, 1916. And so he became acquainted with them. Uh, Dr. Artin was not only a surgeon, he was also a historian and a collector of art, and he had a fabulous art collection in his own home in Marash. So when he became aware that the Zaytun Gospels with, was with um, um, the, the Zaytun Tzir Khan, he immediately understood that this was, to him, a modern educated man, this was a great work of art and a historical monument, a historical object, Askain Kansma are his words. 
And so when it became clear that the, um, the notables, the say Tutsis were going to be deported to Der Sor, um, Dr. Artin was, uh, did not have the ability to prevent their exile, but he wanted to do everything to at least save the book. And he was able to persuade the Ishkhan, who was very unwilling, to leave the book with him. And that is how the book survived. Uh, that was not, um, Dr. Ati was also a draftsman, and this is a hand-drawn map of Marash that he drew from memory when he was living in exile in Aleppo in 1929. Um, so uh, there are many more episodes in the, the life of the Gospels where by just a hair, uh, the Gospels is saved. And some might see in that divine intervention. Um, so the well, last episode I want to mention is that the Zaytun Gospel spent, survived the genocide through uh, Dr. Artin and stayed in his possession um, throughout the war years. But in 1922, when um, a series of events were taking place uh, in, in Marash, they are known as the Battle of Marash in February 1922, um, where it, it was uh, an example of communal violence between um, uh, the Armenians of Marash, um, uh, Turkish nationalist groups that drew inspiration from Mustafa Kemal's um, uh, movement to create a new Turkey and the uh, French colonial presence that was there at the time. So uh, during these very destructive events where thousands of Armenians were massacred and uh, almost half of Zaytun was destroyed by fire, um, the Zaytun Gospels was lost uh, by Dr. Artin. Then it was found by an unknown Turkish man who then uh, gave it to um, an Armenian, and I'm trying to get to the next slide, um, to this family. This is the family of Melkon Atamian, here he is, who was a dentist in Marash. Um, and this photo of the family is taken before, um, uh, before the genocide, before the First World War. Um, yeah, so when uh, 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 Mr. Atamian, uh, received this, uh, got this, uh, this gospels from, um, um, from this uh, unnamed Turkish man, he, they, the family was in the middle of preparing to emigrate to the United States. Um, the Battle of Marash had taken place. They had survived um, that, um, that violence. And they knew, like many of the Armenians of Marash, that the new uh, Turkish Republic um, did not really have a place for them and that they would be persecuted or worse. So they were making preparations to immigrate to the United States, where they had family in Massachusetts. Um, uh, so the uh, Melkona Tamian, having received this book, he was not a historian like uh, Dr. Artin, but he could see that this was very, very precious. And he was hesitant to take it with him because it was very dangerous to travel. So in um, consulting with the uh, elders of the remaining Armenian community in Marash, the elders decided to entrust the manuscript to uh, an, an American missionary, uh, the Reverend James K. Lyman, who was a longtime resident of Marash and trusted by the Armenian community. And that's what they did. But uh, while they were making these plans, this young man, Hago, uh, who was uh, in 1922 around 13 or 14, a teenager, he had leafed through the book with his father and had become enthralled with it. And we know this through his own um, testimony, his own uh, statement of these events that he made around 1983. Um, and he says that he knew that the elders were going to leave the book behind. And that was something that was very difficult for him to understand. So at a moment when he was alone, when no one was looking, he made an impulsive, momentous decision. He removed some of the pages from the beginning and kept them with him. He says in his words, uh, to pr prove that we had existed, to prove that we had lived in Marash. 
And so that is how the pages were separated and came to the United States with the Atamian family. This is their Ellis Island entrance records. Um, and this is the family a few years later. Um, I um, was able to get this photograph from Hagop's daughter, Sonia Atamian Reeves, and I thank Roger Hagopian, uh, the historian of the Marashtzi, Armenians of Massachusetts, for helping me with this. Hagop, if you're there. Hi. So here we see the family again. They are now Americans. And Hagop is here. Um, and the, the pages remained with the family um, for decades. And they sometimes shared them with their priest or other trusted individuals. Uh, but they kept it as an heirloom, as a memory of their days in Marash. And it was only in the 1990s with a renewed uh, interest in Armenian art um, and a major exhibition of uh, Armenian manuscripts at the Morgan Library in New York, curated by Thomas Fick and um, Roger Week and Thomas Matthews, um, that um, this um, fragment, the Canon Tables of the Zaytun Gospels reappeared, uh, was authenticated by art historians such as um, Helen Evans, who realized that this was the missing Canon Tables of the Zaytun Gospels. And sometime after that exhibition in 1994, the Getty purchased the uh, the canon tables from an, a member of the Atamian family. Hagop had been deceased for, uh, for many years by that time. So um, the fragment and the uh, mother manuscript uh, remain in two different places in the world. In 2015, the year, of the centennial year of the Armenian genocide, after many years of negotiation and discussion, a few weeks before they were set to go on trial, um, the um, Armenian church and the Getty settled. They reached an agreement where the Getty acknowledged the connection, the historical connection of the church to these pages. Um, and in turn, the, the church gifted these pages to the, the Getty where they remain today and they are cared for um, by a wonderful team of uh, art historians and conservators. So um, in, the, in the book, I tried to un understand what each of these episodes in the life of the book pretend and what they mean to us today and what do they mean um, in the broader landscape of activism for social justice, um, for uh, cultural rights and of the changing landscape of museums and their relationship to their various publics and the ethics of collection. And um, why don't I stop here and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Great. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Hagnar, as always, um, for that generous introduction, as well as, um, you know, I, I feel very honored to be here uh, to talk about this topic and the subject. Um, my specialty, as, as was mentioned, uh, was, is uh, the intersection of art and politics. So as you can imagine, the Zaytun gospel is certainly within that purview. But I particularly um, wanted to join you also because I think the Zaytun gospel in general and topics around political, the political lives of objects, let's call it, um, are, very, are very important and are actually becoming increasingly important as, the, as our lens and frame have expanded beyond the sort of the walls of museums to include society and the bigger cultural context. So I wanted to show a few slides to kind of give you a sense for some of you who may not know the work I've done, but also just general some of the topics. Um, obviously being an Armenian genocide, uh, the, the descendant of Armenian genocide survivors, as well as, as Hagnar mentioned, a Zaytun C, or his family is from, originally from Zaytun. Um, it, this, to this topic has been something that we've been thinking a lot about in different ways. Ways. But um, I just want to sort of situate that the, our, my thinking around this is also uh, con making connections to other communities. It's not just about Armenians. It's about using this as sometimes a, a case study and as a way to connect to larger issues. Um, and, as for, and as one of the things that Hegnar mentions in her book that I really appreciated is understanding that for Armenians and for many people, we see the Armenian genocide not necessarily as having concluded because denial, of course, is the last stage of genocide for many people. And I think the objects 
um, uh, often become sort of uh, focus of conversations and understanding the larger issues that happen. So I just wanted to show a few slides um, to sort of talk about some of the issues um, around this, as well as some of the topics we've covered ourselves at Hyperallergic, and to kind of give you a sense of maybe the breadth of some of the issues um, at, at play here. And so I'll just do that very quickly. Let's see. Uh, trying to share this, but it doesn't seem to be cooperating. Um, okay. I apologize. Okay, since this isn't cooperating, I'm going to oh, technology. There we are. Here we are. So um, one of the first articles that we published that I think were very uh, important in this conversation was Simo Marakian and Sarah Pickman's article about the erasure of um, uh, Armenian monuments in the Nakhchivan region of current day Azerbaijan. Um, and I think here, uh, one of the reasons that studies like the Zaytun Gospel and what Hegnar does is important is because it helps us understand the bigger implications and the fact that how these, how these sort of issues um, function outside of necessarily one object or one space and how um, one of the discussions in her book that I think is really important is also understanding that Armenians see these objects as part of their culture and often as survivors and as, as sort of remnants. And I think this also ties into larger conversations. And I think we, we can think about how Native American communities and other indigenous communities often think of objects of having different kinds of spirits or as part of their community. And I'll give you an example recently with the restitution uh, and repatriation of a, of a religious sculpture to ne Nepal. Um, one of the reasons the society, that the community there would allow, would brought the object back is they felt because even though it had been elsewhere, it hadn't been naturalized in the United States where it had lived for a couple of decades. So it felt like it was able to come back and be part of their community. So Armenians aren't the only ones who think of objects in this way, in the way that they have lives and, and different things. So in this important study that Simon and Sarah had done, they actually analyzed and looked at these different uh, medieval churches and cross stones and tombstones and actually uh, documented and, and researched how they were actually destroyed systematically by a regime that wanted to erase the Armenian presence. We also did a series uh, last year talking about how the Azerbaijani government often uses art to art wash. So art is, is not neutral, um, is something I like to say. So we have to think of the political life of an object and how it's being used. Um, and I think that one of the reasons Azerbaijan is a good example to bring in in this conversation, even though the genocide happened in, in present day Turkey predominantly, um, is because they often these things, like as we learn as people talking about these subjects, I think people who perpetrate these crimes often learn from each other as well. So in the case of here, we see um, the Zaha D building at the bottom, which was actually placed on top of an Armenian neighborhood that was destroyed at some point. So, you know, art is not neutral, an important topic. I think it, we can bring it up a little bit more the, uh, later. Um, recently, or a few years ago, we reported, for instance, like talking about why this research is important for other communities in the sale of the a Quran at Christie's. Um, when we did an article and a research on that, I wanted to bring up this quote that actually um, Stephanie Mulder, who is an Islamic art historian, talks about the fact that the parallel, she says here, perhaps the best parallel for this Quran is the Zaytun Gospels. Um, so talking about what are the um, what are the issues of ownership and who owns it and, and maybe bringing in spiritual and other significance within a community and how we can start negotiating and talking about that as part of a larger conversation about artifacts and culture. Um, also, another example of how uh, our, the, which I think is absolute innovation and creativity of Armenians to be really understanding how to deal with these topics. Recently, um, the Ar Armenia, uh, there was a court case at the International Court of Justice around uh, Armenian cultural heritage in Artsakh and, um, uh, and in Azerbaijan. And 
they, in this, at the bottom here, a artic wonderful article written by Yelena Bartsumia, and she talks about the, the fact that the true implications of this provisional measure by the International Court of Justice is depend on whether how Armenia will use the order as a tool in its offensive legal diplomacy. But more importantly, I think, Armenia has provided states with a roadmap to protect their cultural heritage from destruction from other member states. So I think this work, even though it sometimes feels like it's concentrated on an object, it's really a much larger conversation. And I think people learn from Armenians work doing this, just like Armenians learn from other communities. So to understand that this is not a one-way conversation, this is a diverse and multifaceted conversation. Um, I also want to bring up the fact that these issue of, of religious, uh, of spirituality and different kinds of issues around this is also not unique to uh, certain communities. And recently, the director of the Uffizi Gallery, the famous gallery in Florence, actually talked about returning religious art back to churches, for instance. So this is a global conversation. This isn't just about things that show up in auction houses. This is about museums and also institutions rethinking how they present the work, but also understanding whether the context makes sense anymore and revisiting what that means. And I think the Zaytun gospel was a really important example of that, where a religious community saying, well, this actually has a different role in our community than the role you see as a museum and a repository. So what could that mean? And then I wanted to bring up this example, which I think is, is sort of, um, some may consider out of left field, I think is actually really relevant, which is the fact that some, why this work is important is because it creates a vacuum that other narratives can actually sort of colonize, for lack of a better word. And uh, recently, last year, actually, there was this sort of publicity stunt by the Turkish Space Agency. Um, I don't know how many of you saw this one about the mysterious monolith. But, you know, they actually erected this monolith. It became a viral news story. And of course, it was kind of odd. Why would there be Turkic, you know, ruin writing on this monolith in the middle of Turkey when nobody claims Turkey is indigenous to Anatolia? That's not the conversation that often happens. But it's often um, an attempt to sort of colonize history. And I think we can see that even in the United States, um, attempts to sort of erase indigenous presence and supplant them with something else. An example, a famous example, of course, is Mount Rushmore, the sacred mountain of, of the Sioux. And uh, that was actually sort of redone um, and, and created into Mount Rushmore. People often don't talk about the fact that the sculptor was a member of the KKK and other sort of things. So this is not a faraway issue. This is very close. Um, you know, here I sit talking on the uh, unceded territory of the Lene Lenape, the Haudenosaunee, and the Shinnecock. Um, there are a lot of these conversations. This also allows us to understand our own communities and our own cultures in, in different ways. Um, so I just wanted to show a couple of those slides. And uh, from there, I actually had a question for uh, Hegnar, if we can start a conversation, if that's all right. Great. <laughs> Sure. So, um, you know, one, one of the things that I loved in your book that you mentioned is you suggested that the Getty could do something creative with the Zaytun Gospels. And you use the example of the Byzantine Cypriot frescoes that at the Dimenil collection. Now, I wanted to ask you whether you thought that the Getty has fulfilled that hope of yours at all. Um, and what were some of the hopes you may have had around this object? Uh Thank you so much for um, uh, for for talking about that. Yeah, the the Menil, um, uh, Byzantine Chapel at uh, in Houston is um, is a great example where um, they, uh, if um, our audience doesn't uh, know it, um, a series of frescoes that had been in the interior of a Byzantine chapel in northern Cyprus in a town called Plisi uh, had come on the art market and they had been looted, unlawfully excavated and uh, taken um, uh, to uh, the art market in Europe. And um, Dominique de Menil, the, the late Houston philanthropist, uh, decided to purchase them working with the uh, Church of Cyprus. Um, and they reached an agreement with the church where they created in Houston a purpose-built chapel where the 
uh, it, it's very modernist, uh, but in the interior, the frescoes were recreated as if they, the way they would have appeared in um, the original um, a church at Lisi. And it was a beautiful, beautiful space. So the church and the, the Medneal Foundation had an agreement uh, that uh, the frescoes would stay there for, I think it was 20 years or 10 years. And once that time period elapsed, the uh, frescoes went back uh, to, to Cyprus, uh, Republic of Cyprus, not Northern Cyprus obviously. But um, so the, that experiment, which I thought was really beautiful, has concluded. And uh, but I think it, it remains a really great model where, you, you know, there are lots of objects um, on the art market that have questionable provenance, they, they have painful histories. And how great, I mean, it, one great way would be to, for great art institutions to engage these histories, to make them part of the exhibitionary experience. Um, there's a tendency in many art museums to look at these objects um, as art objects and to focus on the moment of creation, which is great. You know, uh, there's nothing wrong with talking about uh, what a great artist Toros Roslin is in the, that glorious moment um, in the Armenian kingdom of Cilicia where these objects were created. That's totally legitimate. But that was not the end of the life of these objects. They had a later life, very complex life, where they interacted with many kinds of people, went through many important events, including genocide, migration, looting maybe, um, war, trafficking, or, you know, the art market, which is itself an interesting place. Um, and there are some examples of uh, museums that make provenance part of the exhibition. And you can tell many different stories with that. There are some experiments in Germany of making the provenance um, of the Nazi looted artworks part of the exhibition and to reflect on that particular period um, of, uh, of looting uh, art that was part of the, the Nazi policy and had to do with the extermination of the Jewish people in the Holocaust um, and, and also part of this vision, a Nazi vision of the future uh, where art played a central role. It was not a luxury, it was central. So like you said, Harag, art is not neutral. Art is not a luxury. Cultural rights are not second citizen rights. Cultural rights uh, are front and center. They intersect with many things. And um, the Walters Museum in Baltimore, um, uh, just two or maybe three years ago, they did, made, did an experimental exhibition where they have an object called the St. Francis Missile, which is a medieval sacred object, which is beautiful, but it is also believed to have belonged to St. Francis of Assisi. And so for believers, that is a very important connection. This is a very sacred object. And uh, so the Walters um, had this experimental exhibition where they had uh, set up a viewing space with some degree of privacy where believers could go and have a religious encounter with that object, not just an art, en art encounter. And um, I didn't have a chance to see that exhibition, but I think it is a very intriguing, it was very well received. I have to say. And so um, I think it, it's okay to make these experiments and maybe some of them will not be as successful as others. But um, as you pointed out, uh, Harag, we are in a very interesting moment in 21st century art history where we are thinking about, you know, what does it mean that we have mummies on exhibition in ancient Egyptian galleries? And as my colleague, um, Dr. Mohammed El Shahid pointed out um, um, uh, at some point, um, it is mummies in Egyptology that have helped us naturalize the sight of dead bodies in museums. So we see a mummy in a museum 
case where, I mean, we're not bothered by it, but this is a dead person, um, you know, who, who is the ancestor of some people? Is that okay? Uh, what does it mean that we turn this into an object to be viewed in a gallery? What does that say? So these are really powerful questions that are being raised now in really interesting ways. And when I started researching the book, um, these questions were not raised in the same way. So we really, the conversation has really evolved over the last, I don't know, eight, 10 years in really interesting ways through the work of scholars, but also activists. And we've learned a lot from activists. I mean, the whole uh, statue movement, um, um, you know, questioning monuments, are monuments from the past relevant today? Is it okay for certain kinds of monuments to be in the public space of our cities? Uh, do they represent who we are now? I think these are really critical and very complex questions, contentious question, questions, but uh, they're being raised now. And I think it's a very exciting time uh, to really be listening to these debates. Absolutely. No, I think that's a really interesting point because I think um, the Worcester Art Museum, for instance, and, and others have also been doing some incredible work around slavers and, mm -hmm. and identifying portraits because often there is the allure of the luxury art objects, these sort of objects that see people seem to forget how they came to be. And I think they've been doing some really interesting work in terms of identifying. And I think, like you said, this is a global phenomenon. This isn't, this isn't local. And I remember just 10 years ago on Twitter talking about why the display of mum mummies is, is, you know, why is that allowed? And I have to say at that time, I remember being really barraged with people saying, you're, you're taking this out of context. What's wrong with showing mummies? But today it's actually a conversation. So I think that's really interesting because we're kind of, literally in the midst of this conversation as it's happening, because so much, particularly of our history, has been, has been sort of established in a way that people are not questioning. And I think you even question the way our history has been sort of formulated around our Armenian art. I mean, I've been very critical as well in terms of the categories Armenian art is often given um, you know, and I think when it comes to survivor objects, they often fall in the cracks of those because, you know, they're done in a quote unquote Islamic context sometimes, or, you know, and the idea of, of geography determining nationality is sometimes a very foreign idea in history. Um, so I wonder uh, for you, what have been some of the challenges in general in terms of talking about this topic, um, both within your field, but also bringing in the political, because I know in, in academia, sometimes the political takes on a life of its own. Um, you know, <laughs> particularly in art history and in art, um, because politics are not often front and center in this conversation, or at least people like to think it they aren't. <laughs> Should we say that? Yeah, yes. Well, I mean, let me acknowledge as an art historian that art history has, you know, many skeletons in our closet as a discipline. Um, and, you know, I'll mention the work of uh, Jonathan Petropoulos on the complicity of art history and art historians um, during the Nazi period. He has uh, a new book called uh, Goring's Man in Paris. Uh, it's unputdownable book about a Nazi art historian who was very, who spent the war years in Paris under Nazi occupation and uh, played a very important role in, um, uh, in abetting the looting of, um, of, of art from um, Jewish collections and from um, French state collections. A very, very bad man who was also, who continued after the war to work as an art historian and uh, helped sell works of art to institutions like the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So um, I think uh, art history has a lot of uh, thinking to do about our own complicity as a profession and our own relationship to powerful institutions, powerful states, our proximity to art washing, like you mentioned. We like to think of ourselves as being, you know, we deal with beautiful things. We taught, we celebrate human creativity uh, and we do, you know, that's, that's good too. But, um, you know, human creativity and beauty are always embedded in historical contexts and they are always embedded in relationships of power and art is also labor 
And it's fair to ask, what were the conditions of that labor? What, what were the, the broader conditions in which art is produced, art is used? Who benefits, who doesn't benefit? There are so many different kinds of questions to be asked. Um, so I, I, I think art history has some thinking to do and many art historians are participants in that. You mentioned Professor Stephanie Mulder. She has called for decolonizing the field of Islamic art to really think about what this field has been, has done. Um, our, you know, previously in Islamic art history, there was, you know, there are many beautiful Islamic manuscripts that have been taken apart. Uh, not in some of faraway place, but you know, in New York in the 1980s. So, and without anybody really saying anything. So, I think these are things that we really need to examine and acknowledge. What 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 are the conditions that give rise to certain kinds of practices that today we find unacceptable? Um, and when I started this research, you know, a lot of people told me, you know, don't get involved in a lawsuit. Don't don't say anything. Uh, you know, the Getty is a wonderful museum. It is. <laughs> you know, I love it. I have a Getty mug. Um, but, I mean, um, the, there are amazing people who, who work there. It, it's a great collection. But that doesn't mean that you can't have thoughts about um about certain things and certain uh, legal procedures. But um, another thing I wanted to mention is that um, art activism, you know, litigation gets a lot of attention. And uh, as a researcher, when there's a court case, you know, you have an archive, you can read about it, there's documents, right? We love documents. But um, a lot of uh, this kind of activism is, um, you know, in, in the, the kinds of, uh, uh, activities that you have covered as a, as a journalist and as an editor, the activists on the streets and uh, the labor movements, in, you know, that to think about uh, inequities of labor in the art world. Um, and those are, I think, really important movements that are, that happen in less obvious places. So I think as art historians or people interested in the art world, uh, people interested in human rights, we really have to shift our methods, we have to shift our sources, and we, you know, we have to be willing to entertain um, new kinds of narratives or new kinds of questions. Um, and it, it, it's hard. Uh, I mean, it took me a long time to write this book. <laughs> But um, but I think it's really important, and um, um, and I think art art historians as well as um, reporters have a role to play in um, um, in researching things, in really thinking things through, and having conversations. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, as much as you give a pass to Getty, I just want to mention the institution is political. I mean, Getty, of course, made his money through oil extraction. Uh, yeah. So yep. this is not a, a neutral topic, certainly. Yep. And of course, um, the Getty, their collections are predominantly Eurocentric. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and so so it is it is not, it is a, a decision by a community uh, when, you know, uh, so so the, even the frame that it is sort of presented in in the Getty has a certain connotation. So even mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. um, is is part of these larger conversations, understanding, you know, even the fact that it's a nonprofit. Why did nonprofits come into being? It's because the government can have resources. The wealthy created these sort of this sort of subdivision of doing public good. I mean, there are a lot of sort of elements of mm -hmm. that that I think mm -hmm. I hope people watching this will think about because again, those are not neutral either. Who works at the Getty? Who heads at the Getty? You also mentioned that James Cuno was actually one of the biggest proponents of not repatriating mm -hmm. objects. Mm -hmm. So the fact that the head of this institution is also an individual who is adamantly against repatriation is a political stance, particularly Absolutely. at a time when, when repatriation is sort of such a huge topic right now. And, and for the Getty in particular, there, there were involved um, in so many different cases with Italy, uh, in, in, you know, the Zaytun yeah. case was only one. Um, yeah, absolutely. 
Uh, and I just I wanted to bring up digital technology, just because that's something you wanted to talk before we go to some questions, if that's all right, because I would love to understand what you think the role of digital technology in this conversation is. I think that's a, a very important conversation that uh, we need to have collectively. Um, what worry, it, it's great that digital technology allows us to study artworks better, maybe to help with their preservation, um, to document them, to understand them. You know, I'm not against technology, but um, what worries me is um, the sometimes colonial or imperialist attitude um, and the, the notion that, oh, we don't need Palmyra anymore. Who cares if it was blown up? We have a digital, you know, we can do a 3D reconstruction and it's great. And we can put it in Trafalgar Square and we can take it to New York and it can tour the world and how wonderful it is. Uh, I mean, it is wonderful that we have these technologies, but uh, there are a lot of, I think, very problematic issues that need to be resolved and how certain way of implementing digital technology further um, marginalizes local communities who live with these monuments or with the ruins of monuments that have been intentionally destroyed, again, thinking of, uh, of Palmyra, and how I, I'm very troubled by how some of the discussions that one hears about digital heritage completely ignore um, that dimension of the people who live with these monuments for whom this is um, a, a day, a part of their daily lives and they are, the, that's the voice that is the most um, um, ignored or marginalized. And, and that's very problematic to me. I agree. I mean, I think in the case of Palmyra, it's very interesting that it's a good example in that we often idealize what Palmyra looks like. So Michael Press, a scholar, has, oft, has also written that people forget that the, the yeah. houses of Palmyra that were amidst the ruins were actually destroyed in the 20s and 30s yes. by archaeologists trying to restore it to a state that perhaps never existed quite right. away. Absolutely. So, so I think the, the lived heritage is such an important part because we can often, especially even in Armenian architecture or Armenian, there's this idea of like, it's sort of, we idealize without knowing that if something's built in the 12th century, there were 800 years where it was used mm -hmm. differently perhaps mm -hmm. um, and, and also changed and altered. And these are living objects and not just uh, visions in our imagination, which I think is so is such an important point. So I agree. So um, I know there are some questions. So I, I don't know if um, if Ruken or uh, Anne would like. To, yeah. Sure. Uh, thank you so much. What a fascinating presentation and discussion. This has really opened our eyes to. Uh, this very fascinating, tragic at times, of course, uh, case. I have a couple of questions uh, to pose, but I would also like to remind our audience that if you have a question to pose, especially the students in the audience, uh, please click on the Q&A at the bottom of your screen and type in your question and we will pose as many as are practical to our speakers. So I have a question for uh, Helenar. Perhaps could you comment on other Armenian religious illuminated manuscripts that we know were destroyed around the time of the genocide or where we know they might have been saved, but they're currently lost? Are there um, kind of similar examples you could cite? Um, that's a really great question. One of the challenges is that it's, um, uh, we don't really have a central place to go, like a database, to be able to get a sense of what manuscripts existed in the past and what do we have now and where are the missing ones or where could they be? Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Kevorter Vartanian of uh, the Madenataran has um, um, done some research in um, estimating how many manuscripts there must have been 
in the Ottoman Empire in Armenian communities. Um, and, you know, he goes through very careful, you know, thinking process as to, you know, why he advances, I think the number is about 30,000, and uh, how many exist now. Um, I, I think it's, um, if we are serious about uh, Armenian cultural heritage and Armenian art, and if we're serious about um, the, you know, restitution projects of any kind, um, if we really need to think about ways to use digital technology in a positive way, maybe to create a major database, kind of like the lost art, um, the stolen art archive, or there are many examples. I mean, this is a whole field. Um, and um, uh, the art, art history of Holocaust looted art has, has, has provides many examples of how to do this thoughtfully. So we really need to figure out what is it that we had? And I think there are some sources that we can draw on, for example, the work of um, uh, the Catholicos of Cilicia, um, uh, Karekin Hovsepian, who was an art historian. Um, he was from Artsakh, by the way, and uh, he had a chance, to, he was an early proponent of uh, photography in art history. And before the First World War, he traveled all over the Ottoman Empire photographing um, Armenian manuscripts that were then in their liturgical context of church treasuries and church altars. Um, and his collection exists, but you know, it's difficult to access uh, and so on. So I think there's... Um, a wonderful work to be done, a huge work that no one person can do about really, you know, do we really know what Armenian heritage we lost? I mean, one of the things I learned through uh, writing the book is that I, I had no idea how enormous the loss of Armenian cultural and religious heritage was. I had no idea. And it, it's, it's staggering. Um, and so to me, that makes survivor objects like the Zaytun Gospels even more important. And the work of institutions like the Madena Taran um, that you know, very explicitly dedicate um, at least some of their work to um, the, the, the preservation um, of Armenian cultural heritage and to the survival, um, the understanding of objects that have survived uh, the genocide. And one thing I want to mention very quickly is that um, Armenians at the time of the genocide, while they're experiencing it, they don't know what's happening, but they know that something cataclysmic is happening to their communities. They knew that they had to save their culture. Um, and that it is incredibly moving to me and incredibly meaningful. And so you, uh, you encounter uh, families who, you know, clutch the family Bible en route to their Zor because this is as important to save as the children, uh, because there is no survival without culture, without the religious values that are important to them. Um, and that also extends to uh, leaders of the community like um, Catholicos of Sepian, but also one of my heroes, the um, Archbishop of uh, Aleppo during the critical years, 1925-1940, um, Archbishop Ardavas Surmeyan, um, who was a, a survivor of the Armenian genocide. He was on the April 24 list of uh, intellectuals to be uh, murdered. He managed to escape that. And uh, he, was, he writes about this, that he's very aware that these fragments of manuscripts are now spread all over the world. And some people are selling them as if they are private property. And he's trying to catalog them. Uh, and he has incredible notations like this manuscript, which right now is in the possession of, you know, so-and-so who is on his way to immigrating to Argentina. So I think uh, this is an episode of, um, um, of the Armenian genocide that at least I hadn't understood that um, the, the survivors, while this is happening, are aware of what this means and culture material culture, religious culture is at the center of their experience. 
Um, is it all right if I just add something to that? I think one of the important things for the database that I think is really interesting is it's also difficult to determine what is Armenian, by which yes. I mean, what is your criteria? Does it have to be does it have to be made by an Armenian, commissioned by an Armenian? Like there are many instances, and I think in a in a, in a region where those identities are very hybrid. Um, I know Rachel Goshkarian has written about this extensively in different ways in her work on Anatolia and the region. It's it's the the identities are not the way we understand identities, perhaps in 21st century. So it's also very difficult to do this work without falling into nationalist paradigms, without. Trying to, follow, trying to understand how an object can be part of many communities potentially, or how, how something could be made and isn't just Armenian, but is also a, maybe a subset of an Armenian sort of uh, craft. And, and so I think that's also one of the struggles we're having in the 21st century with some of this material, because it feels unfamiliar if from a medieval perspective of how they may have viewed these objects mm -hmm. too. And then going forward, that, what could that mean? Yeah, I want to amplify that really quickly. I think you made a very, very important point. Um, and I think such objects or sites are really, really important right now when we want to initiate um, you know, processes of whatever you want to call it, dialogue, discussion, dare I say, reconciliation um, at the local level or at broader levels. So I'll give you, uh, you know, my father's family is from Musadal, not far from Zaytun and my father's village, um, um, they, we have a sacred tree Okay, which is sacred to Armenians and to the local Muslims. Um, and if, uh, you know, I've been there and it is, you know, it is a holy site and it's next to a beautiful spring. And so these are really important sites um, that have, uh, you know, there have been the repositories of devotion by many different communities over centuries, but I think have the potential today of uh, initiating different kinds of conversations that different communities can have together about really thinking, um, you know, acknowledging Acknowledging the pain and the crimes of the past, but also finding places that we can approach together. And it's difficult. <laughs> it's not easy. Um, but I, I think there's a, a great potential there that should not be squandered. Thank you. Ruken, would you like to go next with a question? Yes, I would actually, I, I, I'm very much immersed in the, in the discussion that we're having. Uh, thank you so much to both of you. Thank you, Agnar, for the, for the, for the wonderful, present, wonderful presentation and the, and the much stimulating discussion. I need time to process everything, but uh, just to continue from the last point you made, Agnar, uh, being an historical anthropologist myself, I read the missing pages also pretty much like, a, like an historical ethnographic work. Um, and I know you also, and you also talk about this uh, in the book, and you just mentioned it here. Uh, you did field work uh, for this research across different sites, including Zaytun. Uh, I'd be, I was wondering if you would like to um, tell more about it. Um, I mean, not only both the processes of obtaining data um, and, in, and information, but about also your experiences with people um, across, uh, across spaces in the contemporary period. So I have a few other questions, but I can just stop here. Um, thank you, Rukan. Um... So that, it's interesting because um, as, as you, you know, I'm, I was trained as an architectural historian. And so I was compelled to work on the Zaytun Gospels, but I'm, you know, my training has not been originally in manuscripts. And so many great art historians had already worked on the Zaytun Gospels, Helen Evans, um, you know, Sirapi Derner Sessian um, and others. So I felt that I really didn't have anything that I could add to their study of the Toros Rostlin style and to, um, you know, the development of uh, Cilician painting. Um, so I, 
I thought, okay, what can I, <laughs> how, what is my way in? And I thought I, I have to leverage my training as an architectural historian where field work is part of our method. So you, you study buildings through a number of different uh, representations, photographs, plans, et cetera, but most importantly, you study buildings through uh, visiting them and experiencing them as spatial environments and so on. So um, I thought, okay, I can do the same thing in Zaytun. I know how to do that. Uh, so um, in, in a way it was a little bit different because when you're trying to do, um, to understand the historic Armenian layers of these places in present day Turkey, you're trying to reconstruct layers that are erased, right? That are not there, but there are traces. Um, and so you can build on things that you see uh, and in historic maps and so on. Uh, so it's a process of, you know, triangulation of the, the landmarks that you have in, say, a hand-drawn map or a verbal description taken from, you know, um, uh, an oral history interview of a survivor, like the database of oral history interviews preserved uh, at USC at the at New Shoah Institute that uh, I spent a lot of time um, listening to because I wanted to understand how did Zaytun, what was Zaytun's religious life like? What, when would they have had the opportunity to see the Zaytun Gospels? And so it was important because in fact, they would never have seen it. They would never have looked at these incredible images, uh, these uh, paintings by Toro Strostlin. They would only have seen the Zaytun Gospels at certain times in the liturgical calendar held up by the priest during specific occasions. So the power of the object for Zaytunsis came not from its art. They had no idea who Toros, who Toros Rostin was. It came from the fact that it contains the word of God and that it is a religious object. But um, so um, to go back to the question of method, um, when, of course, when you do field work and um, the, the ethnographic type work, you are dealing with the contemporary uh, inhabitants of the places where you are. Um, and, it, you know, you, you, you really have to prepare, you have to um, find local uh, interlocutors. And one of the things, um, I had a very positive experience um, in general, um, uh, doing this, this field work. And one thing I'll highlight is that it's very, there, there are, um, in Turkey, as in many places, there are local historians who care deeply about their town and its history and who are intent on understanding the past of their town. And uh, in various ways, each of them has to deal with the fact that they're doing local history, but at some point their local history comes into collision with official history which erases certain events, which erases certain people, and which wants to depict certain events in a certain way, right? So the Zaytun Armenians rebelled, they were bad, they were not good Armenians, they rebelled. And then they <laughs> are gone. <laughs> so, um, and Marash actually has a very interesting museum uh, that depicts the Battle of Marash and the, um, you know, the, the official version of events um, where, you know, Armenians vanish and that's the right thing. Um, so it's uh, it, in some ways, you know, when you're the, I mean, I'm an Armenian, I'm there. It, it's very, it's very, very interesting because who else uh, who other than an Armenian is going to make their way to Zaytun to visit this place? I mean, it's not on the tourism itineraries of Turkey, right? It's not the beach. It's not, you know, the major monuments that official heritage has. It's a, you know, local place. Um, and so people know exactly who you are and why you're there. There's no other reason. So it, it makes for very interesting encounters where people are very hospitable and kind, but there's also something unsaid that is, um, is very, can be very poignant. Um, and I'll point to a book that's forthcoming um, 
from Stanford University Press by Carol Bertram called A House in the Homeland. It is an amazing book. Um, um, I've, uh, I've read it and uh, uh, amazing book where Carol Bertram, who is um, an art historian, also uses ethnographic methods. Uh, and she accompanied um, mostly American and European Armenians who are returning to visit their ancestral homes in Anatolia, which of course they have never seen, uh, but they have, photographs and other relics from their um, parents, and they want to visit the home where the ancestors lived. I mean, it's a very complex book um, and really articulates these encounters um, in very interesting ways. And there's a lot of discussion of the local interlocutors of, um, of these uh, you know, self-described pilgrims. Uh, it's very, very rich topic. Um, uh, it, painful at times, complex, um, but I think very, very interesting. Thank you, Ignor. Thank you. Yeah, I, I should mention that Carol Bertram is actually in our lineup of speakers, so we are hoping to hear from her uh, in a couple of months in one of our uh, Zoom-based webinars. So I have another question um, from our audience. Uh, wonderful lecture, very moving and powerful book. Can you comment on significant examples, if any, of Armenian religious art that might exist in Turkish museums and any efforts there of historical reclamation? That's a great question. Um, yeah, that's, how do I answer it? Um, there probably are, um, many more Armenian objects in um, present day Turkish museums, but I don't know what they are. There are no catalogs there. It's kind of something you hear people tell you, don't tell anyone, don't make noise. Um, but but there are some instances, for example, the great Sirar Pider Nersesian, um, the, um, um, uh, she was a historian of Byzantine and Armenian art at Dumbarton Oaks, really a major, major figure in art history who I think is deserves to really be reappraised and understood as a major art historian of in the United States of the, the middle of the 20th century. Um, so uh, she herself was born in Istanbul. Um, but um, was only able to visit um, Istanbul once in 1952 on sabbatical. Um, I don't know if she tried to gain access to Tokapa Palace Museum or not, uh, but there is a beautiful Armenian Gospels held there, and there's uh, one article written about it by uh, a specialist who has consulted it a Turkish Armenian specialist. And so Sira Pider Nersesian uses um, this person's work and she had never seen it herself. So um, I was surprised a couple of months ago when I saw an online ad for um, the Museum of Calligraphy um, in, um, uh, in Istanbul, where you know it's an ad for the museum inviting people to visit and they show different kinds of objects that they have. And one of them was Armenian, Armenian writing, but it wasn't, you know, the word Armenian was not used. So I think that's, um, that's something to investigate. I think there are things, but uh, how do you approach that uh, with state institutions in Turkey? It, it's delicate and because we don't want to endanger these objects, right? So it's, a, it's very, very difficult. Thank you. Um, if okay, I, I have a question very much related to this discussion, actually, Agnar. Uh, and Hurag also. Um, we know Turkey and the US recently, uh, in, two, in January 2021, um, signed a cultural property agreement, right? Uh, and one that was that was actually very offensively worded as well. Um, what would be the what are the possible implications of the treaty for the possibility of recovering um, um, stolen or or 
uh, confiscated or extracted Armenian or Greek art uh, that is now now in um, in Turkey in the museums or 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 that stand as built heritage. Um, Herak, do you want to take that? I okay. actually not sure how to answer that, so I was hoping you would. <laughs> so, so these these MOUs they're done, you know, between State Department and um, other states, um, and it is a mechanism by which um, you know these international legal instruments um, that are against the trafficking of art and so on um, can actually be legally implemented. So, um, and the U.S. has instruments like that. I mean, it has one with Syria, um, with many other countries, with Egypt, I'm sure. Um, and, you know, it's, there's nothing wrong with the instrument itself. It's a great thing. And I have said before that, you know, why doesn't Armenia uh, sign one with the, the State Department? I think it's a good idea because for any state, because it provides a way to, um, to track any objects that have been trafficked. So, so that part is great. And we, you know, we are all against the uh, trafficking and unlawful excavation of, um, of archaeological sites. And of course, Turkey is full of incredible archaeological sites that, um, you know, it's not possible to protect all of them at all times. Um, uh, so um, in that, so I want to establish that. Um, so, but on the other hand, what's tough is that, um, and, it, and I have the same opinion with the MOU with Syria, is that when you have a state who has, um, you know, not always been the best actor in protecting the cultural heritage on its own territory, or as, you know, some reports and allegations exist that has been actively involved in destroying cultural heritage of various kinds on its own uh, territory, then, you know, having sort of the, the fox being in charge of the, what's that expression? You know what I'm trying? Yes, yes. So it's sort of that a situation. Um, so that, that's the comment I would make. There have been other comments by legal scholars about the particular MOU here. So we'll see how this affects actual cases. Um, in general, I will say that to my knowledge, uh, when Turkey as a state has made claims uh, about uh, specific objects that um, it has argued have been exported illegally, um, it, the concentration has been antiquities, like antique objects, not uh, Armenian or Greek, or uh, I think there's a couple of examples of Islamic objects, but they're overwhelmingly like the so-called weary Hercules um, uh, it process that was with uh, Germany. And uh, recently um, uh, the state of Turkey, in fact, lost a case uh, in the United States where they um, uh, were claiming a, a beautiful ancient object known as the stargazer. Um, and so Turkey argued that this object had been um, unlawfully exported uh, from Turkey and uh, it was um, civil litigation and, and Turkey uh, lost. And so th there's a lot of legal analysis on that. I mean, I'm happy to go down that rabbit hole, but you probably don't want me to. <laughs> no, this is this is very important. Thank you. Um, I, I, I would have a last question if it's OK. Eh? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I I was really hoping to hear um, you too talk about the, you know the limits and possibilities of attaining historical truth and justice through the available grammars and means of human rights, cultural rights, um, prop, cu cultural ownership, and and restitutive justice. And you gave us just way more than that uh, we could imagine, I think, and, um, and, and process at this moment. And thanks much again for that. Uh, this is a very hypothetical question, actually. Given all these limits, you know, all the processes of commodification, disembedding uh, that are involved in, um, in, in this, this model, this part of, of restitution, um, what are some other ways in which we can 
imagine um, alternative, perhaps more decolonial forms of um, restitution uh, and justice um, for for stolen art, for cultural property in general. Um, maybe I'll start this time. Uh, I think I think we're starting to think about. Um, the uh, challenging notions of, of auctions and, and other ways that these objects often circulate in our culture. And we're starting to sort of um, think about ways that things can be shared potentially, and also not, uh, you know, fixating on this notion of ownership so much, but thinking of models of shared ownership um, and I think we're seeing that increasingly, particularly around communities that may not have the resources and people are sort of trying to think of ways we can share. Um, and I think that's a, an example is even something like the Arab Image Foundation in, um, in, in Beirut, where the, a lot of their collection comes from, let's say the American University of Cairo or other places where they are scanning and sort of archiving, but they're, these are different sort of projects that sort of share resources with each other. And I think that is uh, perhaps a, a model that we should be looking more for, more towards, I should say. So digital resources, as an example, being one of many different ways that we can sort of share um, and, and also, frankly, honor the heritage of these objects because they are multifaceted. It isn't just, you know, the idea that one person owns something. I mean, communities own things. Um, and I think that's one of the things that is sometimes very difficult to understand in 2022 in, in sort of our system and the way it sort of works um, so, that, so, that, uh, so that we don't also fetishize objects and we understand their sort of social character. Um, so I don't know, Hegnar, if you have something you wanna add. Yeah, no, brilliantly put, um, uh, uh, Harag. I, I just want to add um, a word about uh, sites and architectural buildings because who don't that don't move right uh, so uh, photographs or artworks uh, you know move in space and so can be part of different kinds of trajectories and networks but uh, sites don't move and th that's what I'm working on now with um, uh, I'm uh, working on Ani which is uh, of course uh, one of the central um, uh, sites of Armenian uh, architectural history but also um, a pilgrimage um, and uh, it, it's a multi-layered site. It is located um, in present-day Turkey, right on the Turkish-Armenian border. So that there's an example of something that does not move, is rooted in place. And so to um, approach that requires us to use different kinds of tools to understand what is possible and what is not. Um, and so uh, I just want to gesture towards the, the whole field of critical cultural heritage that is um, engaged in some very interesting discussions now about how best to approach sites like this, how to conserve them and preserve them sort of physically in their materiality. And that poses all kinds of questions, especially for very vulnerable sites that have many kinds of engineering and conservation issues, but also in terms of uh, interpretation. Uh, how do you talk about a site like Ani that is, uh, it has been inhabited since the Bronze Age, has many, many layers, um, and has this very critical association with Armenians, which makes it extremely sensitive in Turkey today. Um, and there, I want to uh, acknowledge the work of many organizations, non-governmental organizations in Turkey that have been engaged in uh, promoting the, the, in understanding the material cultural heritage of Anatolia in a very inclusive way. And of course, Anadolu Kultur, the organization um, headed by um, uh, the um, uh, philanthropist and businessman Osman Kavala is one of those. And of course, Osman Kavala, um, has been in prison since 2017, right? Um, yeah. Several years uh, on uh, uh, absurd charges. So um, yeah, I think I do just want to acknowledge and gesture towards these Turkish citizens who are engaged in doing this very important kind of work on the ground in Turkey. It's very difficult. And um, um, I, I 
I, I just want to amplify their work. I stand in solidarity with them, um, but I also want to, to say how difficult that is. And a lot of this work, uh, the activism that Harag uh, spoke about that he has reported on in various places in the world is difficult. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's not easy to do this kind of work. There's a lot of resistance. Sometimes over time, you know, things change and people agree with you and, you know, they were with you all along, right? But sometimes <laughs> not, right? So it's, um, it, I think this is part of approaching, it, for me at least, the part of approaching art history and the study of cultural heritage uh, within a human rights framework uh, that is what guides uh, my research. Um, so, and, and sometimes, you know, it's not so easy, <laughs> but sometimes it's wonderful, right? Positive note, right? <laughs> thank you both very much. Thank you. Okay, thank well, you. thank you both very much uh, for this very stimulating lecture and discussion, um, both Herenar and Hurag, this has been very eye-opening uh, to me as a, a non-art uh, historian, for sure. And um, we've all learned a lot. And thank you as well to uh, Rukin Chengil for coordinating this fascinating event that we've held jointly with her class. Um, we also would like to thank uh, our very energetic uh, Promise Armenian Institute Deputy Director, Hasmik Bagdasarian, who has been very active in all aspects of this event and all others for our Institute as well. And so now let me bring our webinar to a close. Uh, let me announce, though, that we have a number of upcoming Zoom or YouTube-based events that are hosted or co-sponsored by the UCLA Promise Armenian Institute. In fact, tomorrow, Thursday, February 17 at 11 a.m. Pacific, there will be a presentation and discussion hosted by the UCLA Fowler Museum entitled Vital Matters, Stories of Belief, Traces of Humanity, the Armenian Cultural Legacy in Los Angeles. And this will have presentations by Maggie, Maggie Mag, uh, Magdasarian uh, Goshen of the Ararat Eskijin Museum, Amy Landau of the Fowler Museum, Elizabeth Morrison of the J. Paul Getty Museum, and Hernar uh, Watanpah of UC Davis. So you're doing double duty for UCLA and we're very grateful, uh, Hernar. On Friday, February 25, uh, at 10 a.m. Pacific, there will be a presentation sponsored by the UCLA Narakatsi Chair in Armenian Studies entitled Women's History Through the Colophons of Medieval Armenian Manuscripts. This will be presented by David uh, Zakarian, Dr. David Zakarian of Oxford University and with a discussion by Dr. Rosie Arush. And on Saturday, February 26 and Sunday, February 27, uh, in the afternoon, there will be a hybrid that is a jointly uh, conducted in-person and Zoom-based conference hosted by the Ararat Eskijin Museum entitled 1860 Gesaria, or Kayseri, to Los Angeles, 2022 Mapping Culture and Sharing Stories. So for information on these and other upcoming events, please visit our UCLA Promise Armenian Institute website or visit us on social media to see more details on these events and to sign up uh, to join them. So once again, thank you for your attendance at this event. Thank you to our speakers. And we look forward to having you participate in future events for the Promise Armenian Institute at UCLA. Thanks to all and we'll be ending the webinar.